In this part of the Vintage Motherboard Hole series, the Intel SR440BX Micro ATX Slot 1 motherboard. Hello everyone and welcome to part 4 of the Vintage Motherboard Hole series. In today's video we have the Intel SR440BX, codenamed Sun River with the Intel 440BX chipset, which is codenamed Seattle. And yeah, it is a Slot 1 motherboard. As we can see, we have the slot 1 cartridge over here. The Intel 440BX chipset is located under there. We have the two SD RAM slots there, 20 pin ATX header. We have a vast array of memory modules or chips over here. These are for the integrated Riva TNT video chipset that's underneath this A open heatsink, which I stole from another motherboard. And uh, we have a total of 16 megabytes of VRAM installed on this board right now. We have IDE channels here, two of them, floppy of course. The uh, CR2032 battery is located over there. Various stuff around the board, not really too much that is very noteworthy. We have four IS or four PCI slots and a ISA slot, which, and the bottom two here are again a combo slot. So you can only use uh, either one of them in your case. Uh, we have Ensonic. Uh, audio on here, which supports the emulation of both Sound Blaster as well as uh, Ansonic Soundscape, which is interesting. We'll uh, hopefully get it up and running so we can see uh, what it sounds like, because that will be interesting to compare to a uh, Sound Blaster 128, for example, which would be contemporary to this. Um, so, yeah, that is the actually tour of this side of the motherboard. Of course we have some headers scattered around the board for CD audio and uh, stuff like that. We have some case fan headers. In terms of onboard I.O. we have PS2 here, two USB ports, serial VGA parallel, game port and three audio jacks. So I guess that concludes the outside tour of the motherboard. Let's get some components installed and see if she wants to post today. Alright, let's get this party started. First of all, we're going to need a CPU. I finally have a Pentium 2. This is a Pentium 2 400. It has an aftermarket heatsink. Which I think will actually interfere with this particular board. So what we're going to do, even though it's not officially supported, uh, we're going to try a copper mine, just like in the previous videos. Because this one has a cooler that will clear those capacitors from what I can see here. So we're not gonna risk damaging this board because it's uh, micro ATX and slot one is actually a rare combination. You wouldn't be able to tell from the, the amount of videos that I'm getting out of these, but yeah. We actually have three in total uh, in this hall, so. go. It clears the capacitors. So that's what we want. What we also want is some power. We'll put in the 20 pin like so. If it doesn't end up working we're going to have to try uh, with a slight modification because we can't use this clip. This clip has to stay off in order for it to clear the cap. So we'll go from there. All right, suppose we're not going to introduce all of those extra variables like we did with the chain tech board. We're going to keep this simple today. So we need some SD RAM. Let's see, let's grab a stick that we know works. We have some 64 megabytes. As well as a 128. We're going to go with a 128. There we go. That's firmly installed, happy with that. So that should be enough for the onboard component side to see if it posts. Doesn't mean that we don't need peripherals though. So we're gonna install some peripherals. I'm not sure we're gonna need the audio jack right now, but we're just gonna use it anyway. 
Uh, yep, and we need a VGA. And that should be all we need. Now we should be able to flip the power supply on and go from there. All right, no CRT this time. <laughs> and it powers right up from the power supply button, okay. Let's see if something happens. That's what we call a no post situation. Right, so what we'll do... As we've done before, we'll swap out a memory with known good memory, which is this Infineon module that I've been using for the other slot one board. as well as the slot or socket A1. So I'll power the board right up again. See if we get some signs of life, whether or not it was memory. And again, it was memory. All right, so this system is picky. And we have a CMOS error. Even though I believe this was a new battery, I pre-swapped it, but I guess not. Or that circuit is dead. Who knows? Or it's set to the wipe position. Because something that's interesting about this motherboard. You can see this header right here, right? This is actually uh, to set the settings for the motherboard. If it's set into one position, it will always clear the CMOS on post. And the other setting is for uh, retaining the settings. So now it will, it's probably still in setup mode. It's also best practice to turn the computer off when you switch this jumper over. So we'll do that. And then we can go back to our monitor. Yep, post again. And immediately under setup, so I guess this is the setup setting. Or position. Oh, that's interesting. All right. I'm not terribly fussed about that right now. All I want is just to have it post, and then we can do other troubleshooting after that. Yep, post again, no problem. Okay. Should be either delete or F2. And it ignored us completely, which is typical. I don't know which of the keys it is, so I'm just going for both of them. There we go, okay. Let's see if we can get this image to work properly. Let's go for auto-adjust. There we go. And move over here. Okay, so we're in 1996, apparently. I didn't know any English in 1996, so bear with me. I'm going to have to switch to toddler language. Um, okay. All right. We'll disable the serial ports. We'll disable the parallel port. We keep the audio device enabled. We're going to use a plug-and-play OS. I'm going to set this to yes. I'm going to enable the IDE controllers. I'm going to be setting all of these to auto, so it doesn't need to have any manual inputs when you actually plug in a drive. You can set these manually, of course, to a CD-ROM or a hard drive if you have the settings for a particular drive. We're going for now to disable the floppy controller so we don't get the floppy issue on boot. I'm too lazy to press F1. Primary feeder adapter is AGP. As you've noticed, there is no AGP slot, so it is the onboard Riva TNT. We have no password. We have a quiet boot. Okay. 
This place OEM logo instead of post messages. Yeah, that would be nice to have. So we'll enable that. I always enjoy looking at those. Uh, certain post tests. Yep, that's the memory test. We don't want that. Set the boot priority. First ID hard drive is fine for the third boot device. We want that PC ROM and then first ID hard drive. Oh, I can really care less about that setting. We'll just set it a second if we ever install this in a system with two hard drives. And we'll save that and see if it posts. Yep, it does. Motherboard manufactured by Intel Corporation. All right. That's snazzy. Something failure. And again, it blocked the display. FTC failure. Yeah. Obviously, we've disabled the flappy disk controller, so now it's failed. Makes sense. Uh, also, what I didn't actually mention is we are actually running our Pentium 3 750 copper mine that this board explicitly does not support. Supposedly. And we have boot filler because there are no drives. Right, so that makes sense as well. Um, next step, we're going to put uh, an operating system on this system, connect a hard drive, and then we'll go from there. Alright, drives connected. Let's go into the operating system. Yep, the audio chip in here is labeled as the Creative Sound Blaster Audio PCI 64V. But it is basically an Ansonic Soundscape derived chip. This is from uh, after uh, Creative bought and Sonic. She is a beeper. It's actually very intelligent what I've noticed from setting this thing up is that the audio PCI 64V readjusts depending on the motherboard resources it finds. Which means that, uh, yeah. It's possible that if your BIOS is reset and your parallel and serial ports are re-enabled, it will need to uh, assign a different address in IRQ. But once that's done, Bob's your uncle. There we go. Let's set a different resolution. We're at 800 by 600. Let me go up to 1024 by 768. Refuse to restart for that. That's for the week. I know that the start button is now obscured by the optical drive. We'll readjust that later. But we are in Microsoft Windows 98. So that's that. So what we'll do next, like in previous parts, we're going to run some benchmarks. We'll also take a look at our DX Diag here, so we can see our Riva TNT. We have an Intel Pentium 3. 64 megabytes of RAM at the moment. It's not a whole lot, but it'll work for now. Here we have our Riva TNT. 15.5 megabytes. And we have all the accelerations enabled. Here we can do a DirectX 7 test. I'm not actually sure this thing supports DirectX 7, but I guess it does. And that works fine. So we got full 3D acceleration. Direct 3D8 should not work because it does not support Direct 3D8. In theory. I guess it does it in software. So yeah, that's working. Let's do some benches. Alright, so you know the drill by now. Let's go into 3D Bench 1.0C first. Should see similar performance because it's mostly CPU limited. 365.8 on our Pentium 3 S750. Let's go to Krish's 3D Bench. Krish, oh, that's new. Anyway. Yep. 
Yep, 166 frames per second. PC player, 640, 480. Almost looks feet sinky. The completion there, and we have something again. It's just outside of you. Yep, 75.3. All right, decent score. Let's go for Doom Max Details. We're likely going to be limited to our CD ROM speed again. Yep, we are. I guess I should install these uh, programs on the hard drive. But yeah, this this is much better than on the chain tech. I don't know what was wrong with that board, but there's definitely something not quite right. And quick as well. 640, we're going for broke straight away. Huh, and it crashed. Decent. Ah. Uh, I guess we'll do the 360, 480 one. See, that wants to play ball. Yeah, that works fine. Quite fast as well. Yeah, I guess we probably need to do some follow-up videos on the Chaintech board, because it was not performing whatsoever. We have 52.8 on this benchmark, which was a 360 by 480, which is a weird resolution. We'll run the regular one for comparison. In full CPU rendering. And we have 134.7. Very nice scores. Very nice indeed. Okay. So, so far the performance appears quite good on this system. Let's see if we have some other games installed. Yep, we have Duke Nukem 3D, which of course we will need to test to hear some of that... Uh, and Sonic soundscape-like music. I've already said it's the soundscape beforehand, just so we can go through this a little bit quicker. Definitely sounds different to just the general MIDI that you find in the GS Wavetable synth in later versions of Windows. It has a very unique sound to it. It, it sounds different to Sound Blaster 128, and it also sounds different to the GS Wavetable synth. So, yeah. Again, a sound chip on board with a unique sound. It's very nice in my book. It should also support the. Uh, Ad lib sound, as far as I know. So we see we can make that work. Actually sounds terrible. Really terrible. So maybe that's not the best use case for this. Let's put it that way. 
Oh well, at least we know that now. So, another game that we have on here, which will support the 3D rendering capabilities of the Riva TNT, is of course the very first Unreal Tournament. We also have Unreal Gold on here, because I have the Unreal Anthology on disc. Which is a decent uh, compilation of Unreal, Unreal 2, Unreal Tournament, Unreal Tournament 2004. And of course all of the uh, various expansion packs that were available at the time of that release. That's not the sound of it. And there we are. We're at 640-480 high details. The heatsink is nice and toasty. I don't think we have hardware 3D support on this sound chip. But we'll turn it on anyway, see if it helps. It's, for, it's running suspiciously slowly. I guess it's because of the 64 megabytes of RAM. But we'll see. Yeah, I guess it's the RAM. This game does not like 64 megabytes of RAM. Okay. Get our render stats in the frame. Other than that, it runs fine though. It's just a bit itchy. Let's see if we can blow off some people. Yep, we could. Excellent. What are you doing here? Bye bye. Whoops. Yeah, that's karma for you right there. And there we go. We don't want you there. Is that our only enemy? Just one. Oh, no, we have two, but I don't know where the other one is. You can definitely headshot with a Reaper TNT on board. That's what we've proven today. Alrighty then. So, the SR440BX, it's a success. And that rhymes, which makes it true. There's a, a new one for you. Yep, very happy about that. Board appears stable, appears to function just fine, which I'm very glad about. And, uh, yeah, I guess it is time for the next board. So stay tuned for part 5 in the Vintage Motherboard whole series. I thank you all for watching this part. Hope you enjoyed it. And we'll see you guys in the next video.